mathematics does the strangest things to us. For some people, it induces fear and anxiety. For others, unadulterated pleasure. <laughs> How does one subject lead different people to such wildly different extremes? I don't think it's because the world is divided into maths people and non-maths people. I believe it's because there are different types of mathematics. And the particular brand of maths that we experience at school that puts so many people off conceals the essence of the subject. It's time to lift the lid. We start in 1976 when two mathematicians, Kenneth Apple and Wolfgang Haken, announced that they cracked the four-color theorem. This problem goes back to the 1850s. It says you can color any map with four colors in such a way that no two neighbors share the same color. That's quite a claim because there are infinitely many maps, inconceivably many. And mathematicians labored for well over a century to show that four colors always suffice regardless of the map. And when the proof finally arrived, there was something rather unusual about it. It was the first mathematical proof to depend on a computer. Apple and Haken had reduced the problem from infinitely many maps down to around 2,000, really messy configurations that would take a human years to check through with no guarantee of accuracy. But calculating machines don't tire like humans do. And even in the 70s, they could plow through those remaining configurations in a matter of days without error. Now think about the division of cognitive labor that went on here. The human mathematicians crafted an ingenious argument to reduce the problem down to finitely many maps, and they outsourced the most menial task of checking through those remaining cases. Calculation was the understudy to the more creative act of problem solving, and that's all it ever should be. Mathematics has been tainted by its association with calculation. This is the public image of mathematics, a sprawling mess of symbols. And when people declare, as they too often do, that they're no good at maths, what they really mean is they're not able to shunt around symbols or perform mental arithmetic with speed and precision. And the archetypal maths genius is the number wizard, the human computer. And for a time, computers were human. In the 17th century, it was human computers who created accounting ledgers and navigational tables by carrying out routine procedures by hand. In the 1960s, the flesh and blood calculations of NASA propelled us to the moon. So in its time, the work of human computers was profitable and even noble. But calculation has never been a core strength for humans. And when we look through the history of mathematics, we find a deliberate effort among mathematicians to ease their calculational burden. Now, I'm slightly too young to have used the slide rule, but it really was the ultimate in calculational hacks. Because instead of multiplying two numbers, you would simply align your two rulers and read off the values. And the slide rule has its origins in the logarithm tables uh, that John Napier introduced around 400 years ago. And during his travels, Napier had observed how merchants toiled with their everyday arithmetic. And the idea behind his log tables was to reduce multiplication and other more complex operations to much simpler ones like addition. And Napier spent over 20 years compiling these tables. And when he dedicated his canon to Charles I, he wrote of how the log tables take away the difficulty that heretofore hath been in mathematical calculations and is so fitted to help the weakness of memory. Well, Napier was ahead of his time because today, cognitive science confirms that the human brain isn't optimized for speed or precision. And that's perfectly fine because uh, over the past 50 years, that slide rule has given way to all manner of calculating tools. Those technologies that shot us to the moon and back are now available at our fingertips. And that's our invitation to stop fixating on routine acts of calculation and instead focus on our more creative, non-routine thinking capacities. So take a look at this problem. Now, it may not strike you as creative. After all, what does one do but sum those terms in order? Well, number crunching isn't the only way to go. Humans are drawn to patterns and structure, and the most natural thing we can do 
is play with numbers and unravel their connections. And that's exactly what Carl Friedrich Gauss did when he famously solved this problem uh, as an eight-year-old. Gauss's teacher had posed the problem, expecting his young student to work through each of those steps, but Gauss rejected the tedium of computation. And what he did instead was creativity personified. He folded over the sum so that the 100 pairs with the 1, the 99 pairs with the 2, the 98 with the 3, and so on. And he noticed that this rearrangement left him with 50 copies of 101. So much easier to compute, so much more elegant. And now consider how we're taught to solve those problems at school. We're prescribed formulas just like this, which is actually uh, Gauss's method in disguise, except now that elegance has been lost. And there's something rather unedifying about executing procedures that we scarcely grasp. It's only when we exercise the freedom to play as Gauss did that we illuminate the mechanisms that underpin those rules. Well, this may be the most famous or infamous rule of them all. It may take your mind back to a certain bearded Greek mathematician named Pythagoras, although civilizations as far back as the Babylonians have puzzled over this curiosity. And it is a curiosity that such a simple formula should hold for every right angle triangle, small and large. And at school, we were instructed to verify hundreds of instances of this formula, a most bizarre ask of humans. <laughs> we should have been guided to examine the bigger questions. Why does this formula hold? How can we be sure that somewhere out there in the mathematical universe, there isn't a right angle triangle where it breaks apart? So we seek an argument, a proof that elevates our curious observations to the status of irrefutable truth. And here's one of those proofs. It takes four copies of our triangle, arrange them in two different ways. Now let this image speak to you. Let it convey to you in the most unequivocal terms that the sides of a right angle triangle are bound to one another in this most permanent way. One image that carries an eternal truth for every right-angled triangle. And if you're not yet persuaded by this argument, then rest assured, there are over 350 known proofs of Pythagoras out there awaiting your examination. That's three, uh, 350 different ways of illuminating the same truth. This is the essence of mathematics. It was never about symbols and formulas, but ideas and arguments that condition the mind to think and to reason and to explore. Because we don't have to stop there. We can ask just because we can. What happens when we raise the exponent? Or when we consider triangles on a sphere rather than in a flat plane? And these are the questions that eat away at mathematicians, that arouse our liveliest imaginations, and that fuel whole new areas of inquiry. And computers may play their part as we put them to task, but it's we humans who dream up problems and chart our wildest explorations. And those problems, by the way, may be rooted in the real world, but they don't have to be. No cartographer ever dwelled on the four-color theorem. There's no reference to it in any historical atlas. It's puzzling for its own sake. And if you believe, as I do, that the world desperately needs more creative thinkers and problem solvers, then this recreational brand of mathematics is one we must all embrace. It's the most powerful thinking system we've ever invented. It's also the most inclusive, because it plays to our core human strengths. And when we reduce it to something as blunt as calculation, we squander our creative potential. You are more than a calculator. So cast aside the drudgery that you thought was mathematics and awaken the mathematician that lurks within all of us. Thank you. <laughs>